When you think about the wealthiest NFL players in history, people like Patrick Mahomes and Peyton Manning probably pop into your mind. However, when looking at the history of the league, the richest player in NFL history wasn't even a starter for most of his career. Jerry Richardson managed to turn his NFL bonus from 1959 into a multi-billion dollar net worth and then destroyed his reputation with allegations of misconduct. Today on Football Lore, we go over the story of Jerry Richardson, how he built his empire, and eventually destroyed his reputation. Press the like button if you're excited for the video. Jerry Richardson was born in Spring Hope, North Carolina in 1936. He grew up in a tough home with no indoor plumbing. This country lifestyle instilled a toughness into Jerry that would serve him well both on the field and in business. He was never the largest athlete. In fact, he was dramatically undersized to play the receiver position. At six foot three and just 150 pounds, he had the nickname Stick in high school. Despite his small size, Size, he had an outsized performance on the field. He ended up attending college at Wofford University in South Carolina, where he would be playing receiver. Wofford is a small liberal arts college that isn't known for athletics, but he would still become a two-time All-American. Even though he was playing football in the 50s, he still holds records at the school for receiving. His best game was a performance against Newberry College, where he would have 241 yards receiving. When not on the field, he was making sure to get involved in as many activities as possible, which would start to build his business network. He was in a fraternity, president of a Greek life council, and a cabinet member of the SCA. At the time, the NFL existed, but it was not the juggernaut it is today. Players could make a decent living playing, but it was nothing compared to the millions we see today. Regardless, he would be selected by the at-the-time Baltimore Colts in the 13th round of the NFL draft. At the time, there were 30 rounds, and he would sign a contract with the Colts to attempt a career in professional football. His rookie season, he would room with Hall of Fame quarterback Johnny Unitas at training camp, and this would allow the two to understand what each needed to perform on the field. He would be an important target through his rookie season in 1959, and the Colts would finish with a final record of nine wins and three losses. At the time, there were only 12 teams, and the playoffs didn't exist. The best team from each conference would just compete for the NFL championship game. The Colts would be playing the New York Giants to be world champions, and it was set to be a great matchup. Going into the game, the New York Giants were favored slightly, but Johnny Unitas would lead the Colts to a 31-16 victory. Jerry Richardson even caught what many consider to be the game-winning touchdown that put the Colts safely in the lead. As a rookie, he had become an NFL champion, and as a result of winning each player on the Colts, was given about $5,000. This is worth about $53,000 in today's money, and Jerry decided that he was going to use his bonus to buy his first business. At the time, fast food franchises were gaining in popularity, and he partnered up with his college quarterback, Charles Bradshaw, to open the very first Hardee's franchise. While Charles was in Spartanburg, setting up the franchise, Jerry would play one more season in the NFL before deciding to retire due to money disputes. At the time, there was a real possibility he was going to make considerably more operating his franchise than he would playing football. Now you would need an empire to make what an elite receiver gets paid, but in the early 60s, this just wasn't the case. The Colts would trade the rights to Jerry Richardson to the Giants in 1961, but he would not relocate to New York or suit up for the team, he would instead relocate to Spartansburg and continue to open more Hardee's franchises with his business partners through their Spartan Investment Group. With all partners now totally focused on expanding operations, the investment group would continue to open new locations. By 1966, they had 15 Hardee's locations, and in 1969, they changed their name to Spartan Food Systems. With this name change and increased operational footprint, the owners decided it would be worthwhile to make an offering on the stock market. When they became listed on the stock market, they were operating 25 locations in three different states. But this huge influx in investor money would allow them to grow at an even faster rate. They would scale to own hundreds of restaurants across the country over the next few decades. At this point, Jerry had acquired a net worth well into the tens of millions, which when adjusted for inflation is an absolute fortune. The efficiency of their operation was unusual for the restaurant space. While most franchise owners tend to rely on the quantity of quality approach, Richardson and his team would strive to provide service on a higher level, which made their locations more profitable than their competition. This made them extremely attractive 
attractive to investors, and he would sell Spartan Food Systems to World Transcorp for $80 million in 1979. After this, Richardson would end up becoming CEO of Flagstar Companies, which owned the corporation that originally purchased his restaurants. Flagstar specialized in owning and operating fast food locations like Quincy's Steakhouse, El Polo Loco, Denny's, and the Canteen Corporation. While Richardson is a controversial figure, he did know how to grow a restaurant business. He took Quincy's Steakhouse from just nine locations to over 200, and they tripled the amount of other franchise locations they had as well. Flagstar would become the sixth largest food service company in the nation under the leadership of Richardson, but that was not his end goal. While he had become a billionaire, he wanted to return to football. In 1993, Jerry Richardson was awarded the first new NFL expansion team since the AFL and NFL merger. This team would become the Carolina Panthers and would be based in Richardson's home state of North Carolina. He had worked directly with Bank of America to make the deal happen and became one of the wealthiest NFL owners at the time. He was actually the first former player since George Hollis to own a franchise. This entire play had been inspired by George Shin, who had done a similar thing with the Charlotte Hornets, with the NBA just before the Panthers were added. While approval for the team came in 1993, it would be a few years before they would be ready to take to the field officially. They needed to hire staff, get a stadium, and also set up the infrastructure to support a professional sports team. He stayed on as Flagstar CEO until the team was ready to start playing in 1995, when he would step down in order to take on ownership of the Panthers. They were one of two expansion teams who began playing in 1995 alongside the Jacksonville Jaguars. While expectations for the franchise were incredibly low due to expansion teams always being awful, the Panthers would finish their first season with a 7-9 record. Richardson knew as an owner what it would take to compete, while most owners come into the league from a totally different background. Richardson had played in the NFL. Because of this, he understood the need to take a more hands-off approach and let the coaches run the team. While many owners get over-involved and have unrealistic expectations, Richardson was aware of how the game actually worked. This led to an incredible second season, where they would end with a 12-4 record and would even make it to the NFC Championship game. Compared to how other expansion teams had done in their first few years, this was absolutely unheard of, but the success wouldn't last forever. Their next few seasons were more than disappointing, and Richardson would fire their coach before the 2002 season. The reign of John Fox would be one of the better periods the team would see under Richardson's ownership. Until the Cam Newton era, he would come in and improve the team from 1-15 and 15 to 7-9. and 9. Their defense was considered elite, but their offense struggled to move the ball more than one yard at a time. The 2003 season would be a miracle for Carolina. They would finish the season with an 11-5 record before going on a miracle playoff run that saw them end up in Super Bowl 38 against the New England Patriots. This game is considered one of the best matchups in Super Bowl history, but sadly, the Panthers would fall short. After this, they would have a few decent years before moving on to new head coach Ron Rivera. Ron Rivera would draft Cam Newton with the first pick he had as a Panthers coach, and the Panthers would once again become contenders for a championship. Cam Newton would play lights out and lead the Panthers to the Super Bowl in the 2015 season. Cam Newton couldn't get it done on the largest stage, and the Panthers would end up 0-2 in Super Bowl matchups. But as great as the Panthers had been, Jerry was harboring secrets that would leave a dark mark on his legacy and permanently change the way he was viewed in sports history. In 2017, Allegations began to surface toward Jerry Richardson over multiple instances of unprofessional misconduct. They covered a range of sexual and racial misconduct, and records of large financial settlements to cover up these wrongdoings were discovered. Jerry Richardson had settled with at least four employees regarding inappropriate conduct, and while financial figures aren't disclosed, the settlements were thought to be substantial. There was also an allegation that Richardson had used a racial slur toward a scout who was working for the Panthers at the time. This also led to an out-of-court settlement. Some of the specifics included a denim day that would take place on Friday, where Richardson would go around and ask female employees to show him their backside and jeans, and stories involving awkward barefoot massages from employees. The same day that these allegations were released, Richardson decided to announce his sale of the team. It isn't common that franchises come up for sale, so this attracted a lot of attention. Despite the large controversy surrounding Richardson and his actions, most bids were in the billions. This didn't mean that there were not any noticeable changes. Richardson was removed from all day-to-day -day team activities, and a statue that had been built of him outside of the stadium was removed. 
It wasn't just allegations of misconduct in his organization that damaged his reputation either. Further rumors would swirl about less serious abuses of power, like taking advantage of his wealth during negotiations with NFL players while representing the league. In one reported conversation, he got into an argument with Peyton Manning, where he condescendingly asked the quarterback if he needed help reading a revenue report. The NFL approved Richardson's sale of the franchise to billionaire David Tepper in 2018, months after the allegations began to surface. The sale was finalized in May of 2018, and it saw Richardson walk away with a $1.8 billion profit on the franchise overall. However, more allegations would surface regarding his conduct at previous companies. It became known that Flagstar, the company he was CEO of, had multiple racial bias lawsuits filed by the Justice Department, and the Denny's locations operated by Flagstar had been sued for allegedly discriminating against African Americans. This led to a $54 million settlement in 1994, and it was one of the largest settlements on record at the time. Players also complained that he had implied there would be punishments handed down for any potential social justice protests during his tenure. While this was being investigated, it is also reported that the Panthers were contacting old employees and asking them not to speak. After selling the team, Richardson mostly retired from the public eye. The settlements and allegations filled the public sphere, and the NFL made it clear he was not welcome to linger around. Sure, he had made a few billion dollars off of owning the Panthers, but after 2017, he faced a reality where his world was going to change. He would fund the Rosalind Salinger Richardson Center for the Arts in honor of his wife and also fund the Wofford College's new indoor stadium that was named in his honor. The Jerry Richardson Indoor Stadium still exists on the Wofford College campus. He would also give the college an additional $150 million to their endowment to ensure their continued operation. He regularly cited the college as the main reason he ever had any success in life and donated over $260 million to the school throughout his life. The school would accept his donations despite the controversy surrounding the man. He would spend the rest of his life mostly out of the direct public while supporting his alma mater. Jerry Richardson passed away in his Charlotte home on March 1st of 2023 at the age of 86 years old. He leaves a complicated legacy. While he had a great influence in the Carolina region, both as a businessman and sports legend. His allegations of behavior force a revaluation of the man he is. Overall, that is the story of the richest NFL player most of you have probably never heard of, how he built an empire and eventually tarnished his legacy. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to press the like button and comment down below on what NFL story you want to see next. If you like NFL stories, we post them a few times a week, so you should subscribe and turn on notifications. Our last video was about the man who scouted Tom Brady and made sure the Patriots drafted him despite not needing a quarterback. Click on screen to watch it.